After World War I, Germany was on the brink of a successful proletarian revolution. For many people, this period is known merely as representing a change from the German monarchy to the Weimar Republic. In fact, most people are not even aware that there was a revolution at all. There are videos on the internet about this topic, but there is little deeper analysis of the political forces that were crucial in not only determining the future of Germany, but the future of Europe, and arguably the future of the whole world. Chris Harmon says that without understanding this period, one can have but an incomplete understanding of the rise of Adolf Hitler and the massacre of World War II. It is in these years that the swastika entered the political stage as a symbol of reaction, anti-communism, and counter-revolution. It is quite reasonable to hypothesize that if the, at the time, world's second most powerful industrial nation had turned socialist, the rising workers' movement all over Europe could have had a powerful ally to bring about socialism in their own countries, adding to the massive revolutionary flame that had been ignited in Russia. Russia was a relatively backward country in terms of industrial development. The Bolshevik revolutionaries were hoping and even expecting the victory in Germany as a result of a chain reaction, which would benefit them as it wouldn't leave them isolated on the international stage. Their leader, Vladimir Lenin, declared only months after the successful October Revolution in 1917 that, quote, without the revolution in Germany, we are doomed. Since the communist movement fundamentally hinges on the unity of the international working class, it would have been of massive benefit to have an industrially developed socialist ally to support the construction of socialism in Russia. And likewise, it was the Great October Revolution that massively accelerated and supported the establishment of councils all over Hungary, Austria or Germany. Quote, we shall achieve victory only together with all the workers of other countries of the whole world, Lenin stated later in April 1918. Defeated revolutions are quickly forgotten, yet from the perspective of the working class, this revolution should not be brushed aside. There is not only lots of lessons to be drawn from this period, but it is immensely inspiring to have history reaffirm that workers' power in Europe is possible, despite the sheer strength of the capitalist class. It is this explosive potential of revolutionary inspiration that is among the reasons the history of the German Revolution is twisted or straight up denied. Quote, a German revolution after World War I? A West German undergraduate in my German history survey indicated she had never heard of such a thing, and until the 1960s the same was probably true of most Western academics, said Robert Wheeler in the late 70s. Winston Churchill derided it by claiming it was part of a Jewish conspiracy. Of course, other liberal commentators state that it was in this period that democracy won against dictatorship. Another reason this revolution is not mentioned very often is that it is a period of great shame for the supposedly progressive liberal forces since it showed how they had zero concerns about collaborating with the most reactionary and bloodthirsty elements of society in crushing the movements that endanger the capitalist system. In Germany, the party mainly responsible for that cooperation, the SPD, has been one of the main ruling forces in the German government ever since, now claiming the chancellor position with Olaf Scholz since 2021. The story of the German revolution is the story of how that party evolved from the, at the time, most developed Marxist organization to an open representative of capitalism, a supporter of imperialist war and a defender of class society. It is thus key in understanding today's left and the nominally left social democratic parties since what had become concrete during this revolution isn't just important for grasping the politics of Germany, but in understanding the revising of Marxist principles and their subordination to the bourgeoisie as an international trend. 
This video will encompass the build-up to the revolution, without which it is impossible to grasp the underlying political forces that led to it and that ultimately betrayed it. In fact, the betrayal had begun long before the start of the revolution. It's the story of the definite split between social democracy and communism, which would forever shape the socialist movement. In the next part that I'll release within the next few days, We'll talk about the events of the German Revolution and how that split manifested. The content of this part is especially topical, since it enlightens the struggles within the so-called left about the correct Marxist position during imperialist aggression, considering the current war in Ukraine and the danger of escalation into a new world war. Everyone interested in ending capitalism, in Marxism or socialism must learn about this period. This video will be mainly based on these works. They have all their particular biases I don't agree with, so I have tried to synthesize all of those different perspectives while adding a bit of my own analysis. The German state is a fairly recent formation. For multiple centuries, Germany referred to a group of various German-speaking states in Central Europe. They were often very divided and subject to the influence of far greater empires. Most people in these states didn't identify as Germans, but as Prussians, Bavarians or Saxons. Unlike in France or in other European states, Germany had not managed to overthrow the monarchy. In 1848, inspired by the revolutions in France and elsewhere, the masses in the German states attempted to do the same. One of their goals was to achieve unity. By the end of 1849, however, the revolts were crushed. The German bourgeoisie failed to unite the various German states, not just because it was weaker than France's, but under the threat of a strong proletarian movement, it preferred to ally itself with the monarchic forces. It's not the last time we would see this alliance against the working class in Germany. The structures of the monarchy persevered, but they adapted themselves to serve the needs of the quickly growing business class. Eventually in 1871, unity was achieved at the end of the Franco-Prussian War, which had also sparked the creation of the Paris Commune, the first workers' state. Bourgeois historians often praise the prowess of Otto von Bismarck for achieving unity and for being the founder of the modern welfare state. But the unification into the German state manifested as a result of various complex developments. Unity served the needs of the rising bourgeoisie and especially of the ruling classes in Prussia who now dominated the newly formed federation. With Prussia containing more than half of the population and most of natural resources. And the establishment of a welfare state wasn't simply out of a concern for the working class. Prussia's king was now also the German emperor, which was Wilhelm I of Prussia from the imperial house of Hohenzollern. The other states had their own kings or grand dukes. Each state had their own version of governance, with Württemberg even adopting universal suffrage. The imperial government was responsible for policy regarding the whole country, such as the navy, commerce and foreign relations. The emperor delegated those matters to the imperial chancellor, which was Otto von Bismarck. The chancellor title is still in use in Germany for the head of government today. This unified German state now quickly transformed itself into the second greatest industrial power in the world, even overtaking Great Britain and thus creating a large working class within a short period of time. Concessions were made to the petty bourgeoisie and some minor ones to the working class, both as a byproduct and political convenience of the rising German capitalism. But the state continued to be ruled by the Prussian land landowning aristocracy, the so-called Junkers, of which Otto von Bismarck was the most prominent. These ruling classes weren't subject to the Reichstag, the empire's parliament, chosen by male suffrage and with little to no actual power, and which ultimately answered to the emperor. Most of the liberal middle classes had been won over by the monarchist National Liberal Party. Bismarck had used the interests of the bourgeoisie to advance German industry and the interests of the upper middle classes to consolidate the new bourgeois hierarchy. Those concessions were not irrelevant. Within the first 10 years, life expectancy rose by over 10 years and 12-hour working days became 10-hour days. Otto von Bismarck established the first welfare state in modern industrial society. The main goal was to gain working class support by directing it away from the rapidly growing socialist opposition.
Social democracy today refers to something entirely different than what it used to in the 19th century. People of the revolutionary left used to call themselves social democrats, such as Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht of Germany, or Vladimir Lenin. The Bolsheviks were part of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party, which was firmly based on the theories of Marx and Engels. The biggest social democratic party at the time was the Social Democratic Party of Germany, or the SPD. Lenin, up until the beginning of the 20th century, praised the SPD as the most advanced social democratic organization, saying that German social democracy, quote, had always upheld the revolutionary standpoint in Marxism. The change in the meaning of social democracy roughly went like this. First, it meant Marxism. Then, it meant socialism, but through reform, not revolution. And today, it means capitalism with stronger social safety nets, or the so-called Nordic model, what they have in Sweden, for instance. In order to understand how this shift in definition happened, it is essential to learn about the history of the SPD and the German Revolution. In the period before the German unification, German social democracy was split into two currents. There were the Lasallians, who followed the teachings of the more reformist Ferdinand Lassalle and the so-called Eisenachers, who claimed to uphold the teachings of Marx and Engels. The two most prominent Eisenachers were August Bebel and Wilhelm Liebknecht. They were the leaders of the Social Democratic Workers' Party of Germany, the SDAP, founded in 1869 in the German town Eisenach, hence the label Eisenachers. The two groups were very divided. When Bebel and Liebknecht refused to vote for war credits for the war against France in 1870, the Lasallians suggested they should be jailed for their opposition to the war. However, a few years later, after the unification had happened, members of the two groups urged the unification of German social democracy. In 1875, in the German city Gotha, the two factions managed to come together by adopting the Gotha program, the party platform of the SPD. At the time, Marx and Engels were heavy influences on the party leadership. They had become the most influential intellectual intellectual leaders of the socialist movement. Wilhelm Liebknecht, for instance, had developed a strong friendship with Marx and collaborated with him throughout his life. Marx and Engels weren't big fans of the Gotha program, however. Marx wrote the critique of the Gotha program and sent it to the leadership of the SDAP. The program was criticized for its concessions to the Lasallian current, such as reformist deviations from revolutionary Marxist theory or the faulty analysis of German society, among other things. The document is now part of the Marxist classics. It discusses the importance of proletarian internationalism or the dictatorship of the proletariat. There are still many attempts to separate those two concepts from Marxist theory today. Although not entirely united in ideology and overall tactics, the party grew very quickly. A mere two years later, the party boasted close to half a million votes, which was over 9% of the total. The SPD became involved in nearly all aspects of society. It established countless trade unions, cooperatives, youth and women's organizations, or newspapers. The SPD was, by far, the biggest working class organization worldwide. Lenin said about the German working class that, for almost half a century, it was, quote, the model of socialist organization for the whole world. German social democracy became a way of life, being involved not just during labor struggles and elections, but in people's leisure time. They established and became affiliated with chess clubs, a swimming association, the free sailing union, cyclist magazines, music and singing groups, libraries, and even a free people's theater to spread class consciousness and critiquing the status quo through drama. Lenin wrote enthusiastically about these organizations. These leisure time organizations were important for another reason. In 1878, Otto von Bismarck managed to institute laws restricting the rapid development of the workers' movement. Hence, more indirect and clandestine forms of organization and propaganda became important. Within the first year of enacting the so-called anti-socialist laws, the imperial German government outlawed about 250 associations as well as close to 200 periodicals and over 300 non-periodical newspapers or magazines. This crackdown did not significantly slow down the socialist movement, however. 
through a kind of Barbara Streisand effect. It even led to an increased membership long term and raised class consciousness by making it apparent that the state viewed the socialist movement as a threat. So many party activists reacted to state persecution by embracing Marxist revolutionary principles. In the 1880s, the party had reaffirmed that it was revolutionary with no illusions in parliamentary methods. However, although repression failed to destroy social democracy, it did lead a great part of the party toward a more moderate direction and opportunism. Since the laws didn't outlaw participating in the electoral theater while hurting the most radical and visible activists, August Bebel wrote in a letter to Liebknecht that a position in the Reichstag, quote, satisfies their ambition and their vanity. With great self-complacency, they look upon themselves as among the chosen of the nation and find immense pleasure in the parliamentary comedy. They take it very seriously. This had a great effect on the party membership. Revolutionary theory was only marginally connected with most of what the party actually did. Another factor adding to the complacency of many social democrats was the success and the relative stability of emerging German capitalism and minor concessions to the working class. Although behind many of these achievements was the working class struggle, not parliamentary activity. What was crucial was that capitalism had entered a new stage at the turn of the century, its highest and last stage according to Lenin, imperialism. In addition to the profits appropriated in their own countries, the monopoly capitalists now increasingly appropriated so-called super profits from the colonies and semi-colonies. Capitalists in the imperialist countries could now use those extra profits to quote bribe unquote the working classes in their own states, leading to higher wages for a section of the working class which came to be called the labor aristocracy for instance well-paid managers, bankers or engineers. Though still part of the working class, many of these people see themselves as superior in social status, weakening class solidarity. It is this social stratum, Lenin says, that became the basis of various social democratic parties in Europe. He wrote, quote, This stratum of workers turned bourgeois, or the labor aristocracy, who are quite philistine in their mode of life, in the size of their earnings and in their entire outlook, is the principal prop of the Second International, and in our days the principal social prop of the bourgeoisie. For they are the real agents of the bourgeoisie in the working class movement, the labor lieutenants of the capitalist class, real vehicles of reformism and chauvinism. In the civil war between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, they inevitably, and in no small numbers, take the side of the bourgeoisie. This was also reflected in the composition of party leadership that became increasingly dominated by so-called high-skilled professionals or small business owners. This and the relative peace in Europe nourished complacency and the belief that maybe incrementalism was the way forward. However, we need to keep in mind that higher wages under capitalism does not mean lower exploitation. Shorter working hours usually go along with higher intensity of work under capitalism. The progress in productivity meant that wages could be improved in absolute terms, but in relative terms exploitation increased. This means that while wages increased a little bit, they didn't keep up with the increased productivity which overwhelmingly benefited the income of capitalists. As one economic historian explains, the, quote, relative income of the workers in 1914 was only about one-third of what it was in 1860. The rich had become enormously richer and the national wealth of Germany had grown, but the workers' share in this wealth had declined rapidly. The relative deterioration of the workers had proceeded at a speed probably unsurpassed in any country in Europe. But it takes political consciousness to understand this. The great majority could obviously be fooled by the dominant narrative just like today. Many radicals who came back to Germany from their fleeing from the anti-socialist laws had lost their revolutionary fervor, and one of them was Eduard Bernstein. In 
In 1891, the SPD adopted the Erfurt program in the German city Erfurt. It was formulated by August Bebel and two gentlemen named Karl Kautsky and the aforementioned Eduard Bernstein. Engels, who after Marx's death in 1883 was now the chief authority on Marxism, criticized this program for its non-Marxist opportunist view on the state. He wrote, quote, The political demands of the draft have one great fault. It lacks precisely what should have been said. What was missing was the necessity of the dictatorship of the proletariat and a few other Marxist components. In order to understand Engels' criticism and the development of social democracy in general, it is important to learn about Eduard Bernstein. He was born in 1850 and had been in close connection to Marx and Engels. He became a central figure in the SPD, but he gained prominence by becoming known as the first major revisionist. Revisionism, simply put, means revising Marxist principles. It usually means to update them toward a liberal direction, for instance, making concessions to the capitalist class or collaborating with it, turning it from something revolutionary to something less combative. The relative stability of capitalism led Bernstein to believe that maybe the contradictions of capitalism wouldn't sharpen as Marx had analyzed. He also questioned the philosophical underpinnings of Marxism, dialectical materialism. He posed that socialism was not the dialectical solution of these contradictions, but it is a result of the free choice of people, that is, independent from their economic and social situation. It is more of a moral option instead of a social necessity, so to speak. His conclusion was that rather than aiming for revolution, the working class should be focused on reforms. It should sink itself into the bourgeoisie, and incrementally change the system from within. His approach is most prominently reflected in his quote, the ultimate aim of socialism is nothing, but the movement is everything. He was heavily criticized, most prominently by Rosa Luxemburg, the leading figure of the left line, who wrote the pamphlet Reform or Revolution. In it she says that the dilemma between reform and revolution is meaningless, because reforms should be in the service of revolution. Her arguments were convincing. By 1903, the debate appeared settled in the Dresden Congress, in which the majority of the party formally rejected Bernstein's revisionism. Another prominent SPD member who criticized Bernstein was Karl Kautsky. He was born in 1854, and after the passing of Engels in 1895, now he was regarded as one of the, if not the most prestigious Marxist theoretician. He was called by many people the Pope of Marxism. Until the outbreak of World War I, Vladimir Lenin, despite many differences, regarded Kautsky as the final authority on Marxism. But for Kautsky, revolution became something that had shifted to an indefinite future. Kautsky was part of the party center, which meant that he was against Bernstein's revisionism but also against the tactics of the left, such as when Luxembourg argued to push for mass strikes against the state after the strike wave of the early 20th century. It was the Pope of Marxism who criticized her. And it was this party center, being in seemingly equal distance from the right revisionism and the revolutionary left, that played a key role in conceding more and more to the right under the guise of not endangering party unity. However, for those not fully aware of inner party struggles, German social democracy still seemed to be committed to socialist revolution. In the meantime, the day-to-day -day practice of the SPD was fully committed to non-revolutionary activities. The defeat in the general elections of 1907 convinced the leaders that it was the extreme left and their revolutionary phraseology that was responsible for their loss in support, a charge reminiscent of today's liberal parties. One of the core issues of that campaign was the German colonization of Southwest Africa. A large part of the party leadership came quite close to the politics of the growing pro-monarchist parties, with some even using Marxist terminology to justify national defense and even colonialism. Also reminds us of many supposed Marxists today. The right line came to increasingly dominate the social democratic organizations, especially when it came to the responsibilities in fields such as finance, the newspapers, trade union leadership and the running of election campaigns. 
This was reflected in the composition of party membership, which came to be increasingly dominated by proprietors of small businesses. In 1907, less than 15% of the membership was composed of those who fell under the label worker. In 1911, about 50% of the members were represented by only 27% of delegates. There was an increasing discrepancy between the leaders and the led, with the petty bourgeois section disproportionately being part of the leadership. This rightward shift culminated when Friedrich Ebert, leader of this right line, became party secretary in 1906 at the age of 36, and after the passing of August Bebel, became the chairman of the party in 1913. Ebert was known as an efficient organizer, intensely practical and cold. He would soon prove to be the chief ally of the bourgeoisie. History mainly remembers two names of the communist movement in this time in Germany. Those are Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, courageous fighters for the working class who were to be murdered in the same January night in 1919. But in truth, those two merely represented a whole revolutionary current rapidly growing in Germany, little by little separating itself from the SPD. Born into the party in 1871 as the son of Wilhelm Liebknecht, one of the party's founders, Karl Liebknecht was to become known to many as the personification of German Bolshevism. The lawyer was imprisoned for 18 months under the charge of high treason in 1907 after publishing his popular pamphlet Military and anti-militarism, which made him the boogeyman of the German nationalists and a hero of the socialist struggle. The SPD leadership looked at Karl Liebknecht with condescension. They saw him as a loud child who cannot be controlled. People described Liebknecht as passionate, impulsive and courageous. Known as a great speaker and agitator, rather than a distinguished theoretician or organizer, he was soon to meet a situation big enough to match his powers. Clara Zetkin was another leading figure. A close friend of Rosa Luxemburg, she led the Socialist Women's Organization and was the editor of its paper, Die Gleichheit, Equality. Franz Mehring was another prominent figure. He had been more moderate, but eventually broke from Kautsky in 1910 and drew closer to Luxemburg. He was one of the older left-wingers and was known for his clear-headed analyses. Mehring, Zetkin, Liebknecht, Luxemburg and others would later form the Spartacus League, named after after the famous leader of the slave revolt in the Roman Republic. The Spartacus League was not the only formation of the left. Another group mainly based in the city of Bremen was referred to as the Left Radicals and would later form the International Communists of Germany, or short the IKD. Among this group of people were Johann Knief, the leading figure, worker turned journalist Paul Fröhlich, and an intellectual from Hamburg called Laufenberg. They were critical of the Spartacists for not fully breaking with the Social Democrats and forming a fully independent organization of revolutionaries. The International Communists of Germany and the Spartacus League would later merge into the Communist Party of Germany. Another group of people who were to play a great role in the German Revolution were the revolutionary shop stewards. Although not organized wholly as an autonomous group, it referred to a group of militant organizers from the powerful Berlin Metal Workers Union, which were soon to lead powerful strikes in Germany. Their leader, Richard Müller, said that their goal was to establish in Germany a council republic in the Russian style. However, none of these men caused so much respect and sometimes outright fear as a woman from Polish origin. Rosa Luxemburg was born in Poland, which was under the Russian Empire and became a German citizen in 1897. Like Lenin and other socialists, she emigrated to Switzerland in 1888, as Switzerland was a popular refuge for socialist activists at the time. There she met Leo Jogiches, who was to become one of her closest allies as a close partner in the Spartacus League. Together they founded the Social Democracy of the Kingdom of Poland and Lithuania and played a great part in Poland during the Russian Revolution of 1905, which got them several months in prison. However, she's mostly known for the role she played in German social democracy. In 1910, the most famous social democratic papers, Vorwärts and Die Neue Zeit, refused to publish her articles arguing for a mass strike. Franz Mehring and other left-wingers increasingly became subject of party censorship as well. Karl Kautsky, who was the founder and editor of Die Neue Zeit, was chiefly responsible for this. 
Already in 1895, Engels was angry at Kautsky and Bernstein for editing his introduction to an edition of The Class Struggles in France, written by Marx in 1850. They had edited it in a way that made it seem like he was a proponent of a peaceful path to socialism. From 1910, Mehring, Luxembourg and Anton Pannekoek, an influential Dutch Marxist in Germany, finally broke with Kautsky completely. At the time, repudiating Kautsky was not an easy thing to do. Even Lenin, who would later drag Kautsky in his writings as a renegade and opportunist, didn't think it was a good idea at the time, calling Luxembourg's accusations against Kautsky an exaggeration. Amidst heightening imperialist pressures, Luxembourg was again prosecuted in 1913 after making an anti-militarist statement in a speech. She was known as an effective polemicist, orator and a teacher. Lenin later called her an eagle. Although a great critic of the revisionist line, she still clung to being part of the social democratic organizations. Many Marxists would criticize her for not putting enough emphasis on independent leadership, clinging on being part of a mass party, even if that party leadership has an incorrect political line. Rosa Luxemburg was a great organizer and revolutionary. However, there was, according to Pierre Brouet, a great price to pay for her refusal and failure to organize into a cohesive, independent left force before the outbreak of World War I in 1914, the first global war and a war which would change the socialist movement forever. More often than not, the story of World War I begins with the murder of Archduke Ferdinand, the heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary, by Serbian teenager Gavrilo Princip, after which Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia and then suddenly drags all the superpowers into a global war. Of course, the real causes behind the war go much deeper. Among the most important ones was the increasing success of German capitalism, which caused trouble for its rivals. While weaker in terms of industry, Britain and France had vast empires which came into conflict with Germany's expansionist interests. They sought to protect their territories by allying with Tsarist Russia against Germany, who was allies with the decaying Turkish Empire and Austria-Hungary. These competing blocs caused increasing friction in Southeast Europe, Africa or the Middle East. It was only a matter of time before these tensions would explode into a worldwide war. For Lenin, the First World War and its politics cannot be understood without grasping the underlying economic essence of imperialism. In one of the prefaces of Lenin's seminal Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism, Lenin writes, quote, The war of 1914 to 18 was imperialist, that is, an annexationist predatory war of plunder on the part of both sides. It was a war for the division of the world, for the partition and repatriation of colonies and spheres of influence of finance, capital, etc. Proof of what was the true social or rather the true class character of the war is naturally to be found not in the diplomatic history of the war, but in an analysis of the objective position of the ruling classes in all the belligerent countries. And this summary proves that imperialist wars are absolutely inevitable under such an economic system, as long as private property and the means of production exists. The tens of millions of dead and maimed left by the war, a war to decide whether the British or German group of financial plunderers is to receive the most booty. The seeming stability of capitalism, so much praised and emphasized by the revisionists, turned into bloody class conflict and the most deadly war humanity had seen within days. The general mood in Germany at the outbreak of the war is typically portrayed with joy, enthusiasm and lust for adventure. Women sprawling flowers over the marching soldiers. While partly true, more recent research has further revealed that this picture is a myth and does not quite represent the whole sentiment of the early days. In Berlin alone, there were 50,000 pro-war demonstrators against 100 to 200,000 anti-war protesters, which are often not mentioned. In fact, even before the outbreak of the war, huge masses, even among the more conservative ones, went to the streets to protest against the looming war. This supposed mass support for the war is among the reasons social democrats then and today try to justify the SPD voting for the Kaiser's war credits. On the 25th of July 1914, the party issued an anti-war statement, which read, 
the class-conscious German proletariat raises a flaming protest against the machinations of the warmongers. Not a drop of any German soldier's blood must be sacrificed to the power hunger of the Austrian ruling clique, to the imperialist profiteer. A mere 10 days later, on August the 4th, the party declared it would be voting for the government's war credits. It proclaimed, for our people and its peaceful development, much if not everything is at stake in the event of the victory of Russian despotism. Our task is to ward off this danger, to safeguard the civilization and independence of our own country. We do not leave the fatherland in the lurch in the hour of danger. After the majority of the party had voted for the war, it adopted the policy of Burgfriedenspolitik, castle peace politics in English, a social truce which means that for the time being, for the sake of the fatherland, the party and the affiliated unions would not criticize the government or call for strikes. This term is still in use today in German-speaking countries to refer to class collaborationism of social democratic parties or other nominally left organizations. It was not until months later, against the pressure of the entire ruling class and the public opinion it dominated amid a climate when any opposition to the war would earn you accusations of treason and allegiance to Tsarist Russia, when Karl Liebknecht defied party discipline and proclaimed in public his opposition to the war by voting as the only social democrat in the Reichstag against the war credits on December 2nd. He spoke, quote, I am voting against the war credits bill today for the following reasons. This war, which none of the peoples involved desired, was not started for the benefit of the German or of any other people. It is an imperialist war, a war for capitalist domination of the world markets and for the political domination of the important countries in the interests of industrial and financial capitalism. The slogan against Tsarism is being used just as the French and British slogan against militarism to mobilize the noble sentiments, the revolutionary traditions and the hopes of the people for the national hatred of other peoples. This show of courage would make Liebknecht one of the symbols of the anti-war movement. He gave the anti-war voices a platform around which war opponents could rally and feel supported by at least some force within politics. Other prominent members of the revolutionary left voiced their opposition to the war, such as Luxembourg, Clara Zetkin and Franz Mehring. Several SPD members were purged from their positions after showing opposition to the war. Luxembourg soon landed in prison. Liebknecht was conscripted to the war despite being older than 40 and then later landed in prison as well. The general mood changed soon, however. Soldiers came back with stories about the war's horrors. Enthusiasm for the war began to wane. Anti-war protests increased rapidly. The SPD could have easily made use of this energy to take a critical stand against the war which was dragging on and on. All pretense about self-defense became empty and laughable. By now it was clear to most that the German Empire was aiming at expanding its power. At the start of the war, state and military leaders of the belligerent powers estimated the war would be over within months. The first German chief of staff, Schlieffen, said that a long war was inconceivable. As the armies got bogged down in the trenches, it wasn't only the soldiers that had to suffer and die for their imperialists. The whole economy needed to be milked to run the war machine. Living standards were hit immediately. Food supply crashed due to people from agriculture being conscripted or because of the blockade. The caloric value of the weekly diet fell to half of what a person needed on average to survive. People worked within a war economy, with mass production ramping up, bringing suffering workers closer together. So while the war crushed many links of organized labor, in a way it created conditions for more explosive organization. On May 1st, Karl Liebknecht addressed the May Day rally by shouting, down with the war, down with the government, before being taken into custody and receiving a four-year sentence, landing again in prison. The one million strong SPD was the dominant power contesting the Prussian state for legitimacy. It was the time to mobilize the masses against the state. But to the revolutionary left, it was clear that German social democracy had abandoned Marxism long ago. 
Lenin called the actions of the SPD a sheer betrayal of socialism. It's not that the party could have prevented the war by adopting other positions. It was their abandoning of the class stand to be on the side of the working class in the face of imperialist war. The workers' parties did not oppose the government's criminal conduct, but called upon the working class to identify its position with that of the imperialist governments. The leaders of the international committed an act of treachery against socialism by voting for war credits, by reiterating the chauvinist slogans of the bourgeoisie of their own countries, by justifying and defending the war by joining the bourgeois governments of the belligerent countries, and so on and so forth. The responsibility for thus disgracing socialism falls primarily on the German Social Democrats, who were the strongest and most influential party in the Second International. The Second International was an organization of various socialist parties around the world. Before the outbreak of the World War in 1912, after tensions were increasing everywhere, leading already to the Balkan Wars or the Italo-Turkish War, the Second International agreed on a declaration in the Swiss city of Basel. Basing itself on two famous paragraphs of the earlier Stuttgart Resolution, which were mostly the work of Rosa Luxemburg and Vladimir Lenin, it stated, quote, If war is declared, the working classes in the countries affected, as well as their parliamentary representatives, have the duty to mobilize their forces to prevent hostilities from breaking out, with the support of the coordinating activity of the International Bureau, by applying those means which will seem the most effective to them, means which evidently will vary according to the more or less aggravated turn which the class struggle may take and in relation to the general political situation. If, in spite of their efforts, war should break out, their duty is to struggle actively for a speedy end to the fighting and to make every effort to use the economic and political crisis which the war causes to rouse the people and in this way to speed up the abolition of the rule of the capitalist class. The breaking of most European socialist parties with this resolution had a far-reaching historical significance. According to Lenin, quote, this collapse has been mainly caused by the actual prevalence in it of petty bourgeois opportunism, the bourgeois nature and the danger of which have long been indicated by the finest representatives of the revolutionary proletariat of all countries. This opportunism was evident before the outbreak of the war through the emphasis on the legalist, reformist, and parliamentary approach, and class collaboration. The backing of the imperialist efforts was only the crowning of this trend towards resignation and compromise with the capitalist system. Quote, Opportunism was engendered in the course of decades by these special features in the period of the development of capitalism, when the comparatively peaceful and cultured life of a stratum of privileged workmen bourgeoisified them, gave them crumbs from the table of their national capitalists, and isolated them from the suffering, misery, and revolutionary temper of the impoverished and ruined masses. The imperialist war is the direct continuation and culmination of this state of affairs, because this is a war for the privileges of of the great power nations, for the repartition of colonies and domination over other nations. Lenin said that this world war was the beginning of a new epoch, in which the aim of the working class was to struggle for power. Quote, the conversion of the present imperialist war into a civil war is the only correct proletarian slogan, one that follows from the experience of the Paris Commune and outlined in the Basel Resolution, it has been dictated by all the conditions of an imperialist war between highly developed bourgeois countries. One must be blind not to see bourgeois and petty bourgeois influence on the proletariat as the main and fundamental cause of the international's disgrace and collapse in 1914. Lenin was accused of causing the schism in the socialist movement, but from Lenin's point of view it was not him and the other Bolsheviks trying to split the left by defending Marxism and rejecting liberalism. It was the opportunists who reject Marxism and defend liberalism. This is a common narrative that is still deployed against revolutionaries, that they are dogmatists, or that they are not pragmatic by clinging on to principles. Well, if you look at the SPD today, or other examples of revisionism, which are fully immersed in the imperialist system, you see that Marxists might have very good reasons to struggle for the correct political positions. There was another narrative that was put forward to defeat and even co-opt the Marxist standpoint. 
As the proletarian internationalist and the class struggle perspective grew, the ruling classes of Germany sought to combat it with the probably most effective bourgeois counter-narrative, nationalism. The goal was to reconcile the working class with the German Reich, to dilute class struggle by putting all members of a nation in the same team. Prominent apostles, such as Reverend Stöcker, sought to integrate the idea of the proletariat as part of the national community. Friedrich Naumann, a racist pastor and liberal politician, who later co-founded the German Democratic Party, sought to combine non-Marxist socialism with nationalism and liberalism proposing social reform as a means to prevent class struggle. And of course we know who later picked up the idea of national socialism and how nationalism served to dilute the class struggle perspective then as well. But this will be the topic of another video that is coming soon. In fact, already at this point, anti-Semitism as well served as a means to direct the anger of the petty bourgeoisie away from big capital, who was crushing it, to a supposed Jewish elite in control of working class organizations. August Bebel called this tendency the socialism of fools. But you can argue that the SPD was part of this nationalistic, socialist trend as well, as they linked the well-being of the German working class to the success of German imperialism, not to the success of the international proletariat against the international bourgeoisie. You can see how at the time the word socialism was quite popular, so various movements used it opportunistically to draw in working class support. Unfortunately, this reactionary trend that claims socialism is still a phenomenon today. As the war dragged on, it became more and more obvious to everyone what the revolutionary left had already said at the beginning, that this war does not serve the people in any way. In December 1916, 20 SDP deputies voted along with Liebknecht against further war credits. Liebknecht was painted as a purist, an adventurist, an idealist at the outbreak of the war. Now, his stance was adopted by a larger and larger section of the SPD. Eventually, 40% of the socialist deputies opposed the war. However, as the Vorwärts pointed out, those who opposed the war represented more voters than the deputies who were pro-war, thus actually representing the majority. In January 1917, the SPD under Ebert expelled those who voted against the war, and these people went on to form the Independent Social Democratic Party, Unabhängige SPD in German, or USPD. The old SPD was now referred to as the Majority SPD, or MSPD. The USPD was a mixed group of different trends united by their anti-war position. Among them were Eduard Bernstein and Karl Kautsky, who now opposed the war as well. They had supported it in the beginning. And members of the Spartacist group, such as Luxembourg and Liebknecht, who for the time being refused to split from this party, as mentioned before. There would soon ensue a world historic event that would massively boost and inspire the anti-war movement and accelerate the end of the imperialist slaughter. One of the chief revolutionary theorists who opposed working class support for the war and upheld the fight for socialism as the correct Marxist position, went on to actually implement the Marxist ideas that the revolutionary left had argued for this whole time. Vladimir Lenin and the Bolsheviks had seized power in St. Petersburg in November or in October according to the old style of the calendar. Every German was soon to learn that the people from a country the German state represented as the quote enemy number one unquote had been overthrown. Despite state censorship, the increasingly suffering and radicalizing working class had seen that revolution and an end to the war was possible. The German minister for the interior spoke of quote the intoxicating effect of the Russian Revolution. Social Democrat member of the Reichstag, Hugo Hase, warned the government, quote, Does the Chancellor want the German masses to end up speaking Russian? Spartakist Fritz Heckert said, The German proletariat must draw the lessons of the Russian Revolution and take their own destiny in hand. 
This sentiment was reflected by the German working class and the German state tried as hard as they could to defuse the explosive potential the October Revolution had brought with it. The argument of national defense made by the SPD sounded even emptier after the victory of the Bolsheviks. They could no longer claim that Russian tyranny presented a danger. The leadership of the USPD praised the revolution, quote, the working class has taken political power in Russia. This is an event of world significance. Never has the working class faced such an important task as this. Two days later, in the same newspaper, it said, quote, we German workers are are with all our hearts with our Russian comrades in struggle in these days. They are also fighting for our cause. They are the vanguard of humanity, the vanguard of peace. In truth, however, the USPD was split on the new Soviet government. Most prominently, it was Bernstein and Kautsky that derided the revolution. Kautsky, who by now wasn't exactly close friends with Lenin, concluded that the revolution would end in chaos, and it is supposedly against democratic principles. Lenin prominently countered Kautsky's critique in the Proletarian Revolution and the Renegade Kautsky. Quote, the question of the dictatorship of the proletariat is a question of the relation of the proletarian state to the bourgeois state, of proletarian democracy to bourgeois democracy. One would think that this is as plain as a pikestaff, but Kautsky, like a schoolmaster who has become as dry as dust from quoting the same old textbooks on history, persistently turns his back on the 20th century and his face to the 18th century and for the hundredth time, in a number of paragraphs, in an incredibly tedious fashion, choose the old cud over the relation of bourgeois democracy to absolutism and medievalism. He wrote that his analysis is, quote, such an awful theoretical model, such a complete renunciation of Marxism, that Kautsky, it must be confessed, has far excelled Bernstein. Lenin is criticizing Kautsky's misunderstanding of the concept of the dictatorship of the proletariat, which emphasizes the class character of the state when compared to the liberal concept of democracy, which conceals it. It refers to workers, so the majority, being in power in contrast to the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, the minority, what we have now. The Bolsheviks saw the Russian Revolution merely as the first stage of a worldwide revolution. The Soviet government used every means possible to spread it in all countries. They even used the German-Russian peace negotiations at Brest-Litovsk on the 26th of November as a platform to spread the revolutionary message, and in particular to address the German workers and soldiers. Karl Liebknecht wrote from his prison cell, quote, Thanks to the Russian delegates, Brest has become a revolutionary tribune. It has denounced the Central European powers, the lies and the hypocrisy of Germany. With the help of many social democrats, sympathizers of the October Revolution would spread thousands of leaflets in Germany to agitate for the revolution. The German military leaders exploited the Russian rush for peace and negotiated a peace settlement heavily in favor of the German Reich. The agitation for strikes and revolution by the Bolshevik delegation was heard, and on January 14th, a major strike broke out in Budapest and soon all over Austria and Hungary. It was estimated that a quarter million workers were on strike in Vienna alone. And thus began what historian Franz Borkenau at the time called, without exaggeration, quote, the greatest revolutionary movement of properly proletarian origin which the modern world has seen. The Spartacus League put out leaflets saying, quote, the Viennese workers elected councils on the Russian model, unquote, and proclaiming a general strike. About half a million workers went on strike all over Germany for several days. Soldiers began to understand they didn't give the their lives to defend Germany while the officers sat idle, sending them to their useless deaths. Sailors in northern Germany got organized and undertook various protest actions. The movement eventually failed under the violence of the military might and its leaders were executed. The others received multiple years of hard labor each. The sailors had learned an important lesson that you can take on the state's military machine with non-political peaceful protests. 
The main problem with the strikes was that there was no revolutionary organization guiding it towards revolutionary aims. Leo Yogiches wrote they, quote, did not know what to do with the revolutionary energy. Most crucially, there was no independent revolutionary party to undermine the confusion intentionally caused by the right-wing social democrats to diffuse the anger of the masses. Nobody could, at that point, openly declare their opposition to the strike movement without losing credibility among the masses. So the liberal opportunists do what they can do best. They co-opt the movement and try to suffocate it from within. The USPD was definitely not that revolutionary organization. It was led mostly by centrists who tried to distance themselves from the Spartacist slogan, the enemy is at home, peace through socialist revolution. They advised against mutiny or other seditious acts. The prominent SPD leaders declared their superficial support for the strike and managed to gain leading position in the action committees of the strike against lots of opposition with one goal. As Friedrich Ebert later explained, quote, I joined the strike leadership with the clear intention of bringing the strike to a speedy end to prevent damage to the country. His party called Schneidemann and future Chancellor of Germany said, quote, if we had not joined the strike committee, law and order would not now exist here. The state knew very well who their enemy was and who wasn't. For instance, following a meeting that was banned by the state, left socialist Wilhelm Dittmann got a four-year prison sentence while Ebert and co. were left untouched. Ebert said in a speech in that meeting, quote, it is the duty of workers to back up their brothers and fathers at the front and to manufacture the best arms. Victory is the dearest goal of all Germans. The Social Democrats did their absolute best to de-radicalize the strike movement. They sought to mediate with the government, maintaining that the strikers had merely economic demands, not political ones, which of course wasn't true. The strike was eventually smashed. Yogiches summed it up as follows, quote, Because they could not imagine the strike wave as more than a simple protest movement, the committee, under the influence of the Reichstag deputies, tried to enter into negotiations with the government, instead of refusing all negotiations and directing the energy of the masses. Only a few weeks after the German high command had been talking about victory, it became clear to them that they were sure to lose after a failed offensive on the Western Front in the summer of 1918. They now acknowledged, after seeing the massive strikes and protests, that the whole country was about to collapse. The only way to ensure stability was to negotiate for peace immediately and to liberalize the government in order to prevent a total breakdown. The leadership of the Prussian military suggested to the Kaiser that there was no choice but to bring the SPD into the government. Secretary of State Hintze famously said, quote, It is necessary to prevent an upheaval from below by a revolution from above. The MSPD was of course in full agreement with demanding the emperor's resignation. They wanted to gain the initiative over the revolutionaries whose support was rapidly growing. But the emperor refused and settled in the headquarters of the German army in Spa in Belgium. The Kaiser's liberal-leaning cousin, Prince Max von Baden was chosen as the chancellor and concessions to the German workers were determined. Philipp Schneidemann of the SPD was among the politicians who were now let into the government and conduct the so-called October reforms to liberalize the government and negotiate a peace deal with US President Woodrow Wilson. All with one goal, to preserve the monarchy. Part of this maneuver was to be able to shift blame for the loss of the war on the Social Democrats in order to save any legitimacy that was left for the monarchy. Friedrich Ebert was of course totally okay with this. His ascension to state power was too close to refuse it. In a meeting of party leadership, he warned, quote, If we don't come to some understanding with the bourgeois parties and the government, then we will have to let events take their own course. Then we will be resorting to revolutionary tactics. A similar development would take place to that experienced in Russia. Part of the concessions to the working class was the releasing of Karl Liebknecht from prison. But all those maneuvers were not enough to calm the anger of the masses and to defeat the specter of revolution. The high command was frustrated in their efforts for an immediate peace. The French imperialists were determined to grab as much territory as possible, just as the Germans did with the Soviet Union a year earlier. In a desperate attempt to defend as many holdings as possible, 
The Germans sent out troops to fight lost battles. But the sailors understood that the leadership was to send them to unnecessary and certain death. One sailor told his father, quote, We all felt this would be our last voyage, and so we instinctively refused to follow orders. And they did, and were immediately arrested. Thousands of sailors, joined by the port's workers, went out to protests at the arrests in Kiel. Nine were killed after clashes with government loyalists, but the movement had learned from their past mistakes and refused to protest peacefully, so they fired at the patrols and managed to force them to retreat. And thus began the German Revolution. Thank you for watching part one. In the next part we'll talk about and analyze the events of the German Revolution, including how social democrats crushed it with the help of proto-fascist forces, and we're gonna cover the murder of Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht. And we're gonna try to draw important lessons from this revolution for future organizing. So make sure to subscribe to not miss part 2, and I'll see you soon. Auf Wiedersehen, Genossinnen.